on a crisp afternoon in March, a smart young Russian woman touches down in London on a flight from Moscow. Yulia Skripal makes this journey often to visit her father in the historic city of Salisbury. But this is no ordinary family and no ordinary family reunion. Yulia's father, 66-year-old Sergei Skripal, is a former double agent, a colonel in Russia's military intelligence agency, the GRU, He's believed to have been turned by MI6 in the 1990s to spy for the UK. It was a high-stakes move, and Moscow eventually found out. The veteran officer was jailed in Russia for 13 years. But partway through his sentence in 2010, he was freed and transferred to the UK in a Cold War-style spy swap. That should have been the end of the story, thanks to an unwritten rule between spies that guarantees their safety in an exchange. But this code is about to be broken. On the 4th of March 2018, the day after 33-year-old Yulia arrived in Salisbury, two would-be assassins close in on Sergei Skripal's house, armed with a deadly nerve agent. They spray the substance on the front door handle and leave. It's only a matter of time until the father and daughter are unwittingly exposed to the poison. They fall critically ill, victims of an apparent revenge attack blamed on Russia's GRU. Good evening, this is Sky News Live in Salisbury, the centre of a major spy attempted murder investigation. Having established that a nerve agent is the cause of the symptoms, leading us to treat this as attempted murder, I can also confirm that we believe the two people originally who became unwell were targeted specifically. The government has concluded that it is highly likely that Russia was responsible for the act against Sergei and Yulia Skripal. People around the world are familiar with the Salisbury spy poisoning. But this attack involves much more than just the act of leaving a military-grade nerve agent. Soon after the first news breaks of the attempted double murder, Russian media outlets begin pumping out alternative versions of what might have happened. Это выступление немножко правды о том, что был такой скрипаль, немножко неправды о том, как что это новичок. Russia-linked social media accounts also go into overdrive. They make claims like, could the spy agency MI6 have done it? What about the top-secret British defence laboratory Porton Down? Maybe it was involved. The barrage of dubious claims seems deliberately designed to create doubt, to play on the allure of conspiracy over evidence-based fact. It leaves the UK facing the double challenge of having to deal with the first chemical weapons attack on European soil since the Second World War, while at the same time combating a global web of disinformation aimed at discrediting British accusations that Russia was to blame. Welcome to 21st century warfare and welcome into the grey zone. My name is Deborah Haynes. I'm the Foreign Affairs Editor at Sky News. And you're listening to my podcast, Into the Grey Zone, which explores a murky evolution of warfare. I'll explain the covert tactics used by states, criminals and terrorist groups to deceive, gain influence and, at times, kill. In this episode, I travel to Salisbury with the widow of former Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko to revisit the attempted assassination of another ex-Russian agent on British soil. But first, what exactly is the Grey Zone? We're neither in a state of peace, nor are we in a state of war, but we're sitting in this very dangerous place between. Lieutenant General Graham Lamb is a former director of UK Special Forces and a master of unconventional warfare. Winston Churchill, his famous book one of his recollection of the Second World War, was The Gathering Storm. There never was a war in all history easier to prevent by timely action 
than the one which has just desolated such great areas of the globe. It could have been prevented, in my belief, without the firing of a single shot, but no one would listen. We were all sucked into that awful whirlpool. General Lamb knows his military history, but he also knows about modern threats and thinks Churchill's observation carries a new relevance today. This is not a case of a Cold War against China. This is not a new Cold War against Russia. This is the 1930s. And so if we don't recognise that we're in that period, probably about 1930, 31, 32, 33, that we are actually in a gathering storm. And if we do, as we did in that time, merely try and accept that others would act in our best interests when they absolutely by design did not intend to, then don't be surprised if we end up in 1939 and a world war which nearly killed this country and would have changed the global order as we know it. Graham Lamb isn't someone who issues idle warnings. I first met him in Iraq in 2007 when he was deputy commander of all US-led forces based out there following the invasion to topple Saddam Hussein. General Lamb has since left the military, but he's still an expert on the world's security threats, in particular, a murky grey zone of harm that deliberately sits under the threshold of what would normally be described as war, though in many ways, this grey zone is no less dangerous than a real conflict zone, and it affects all of us. I find the terms war and peace absolutely irrelevant. Everybody assumes we're in a peaceful state. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're in a warlike state, but not war as we would look at it from, you know, the Netflix Battle of Midway or Pearl Harbor or something like this. We're not in this titanic struggle between the sort of the Wehrmacht and Montgomery on the, um, in North Africa uh, at Alamein. But we are being attacked. We're being undone in, in a very different way. When you think of war, you probably imagine things like tanks, troops, explosions, death. But if you fell out with a state that had a more powerful military than yours, or if you wanted to avoid the cost of a full-on armed conflict, you'd probably try to think of other ways to win an argument. That's where the grey zone comes in. It's a place where there are no rules, and literally anything can be and is used as a weapon. Think about the information you absorb, the politicians you elect, even the technology you use. Just imagine the power you'd have if you were able to make people think a certain way or vote for a certain party or control their mobile phone, laptop or car. You could change the fate of a nation without needing to put a boot on the ground. Um, so thank you ever so much for speaking to me for this Grey Zone podcast. I'm sitting socially distanced in a room in London with General Sir Nick Carter, the head of the UK's armed forces, and Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. You say we aren't in a state of peace and we're not in a state of war. Like, what are we in? Contest. We're competing against every day. Um, some people compete within the rules and some people compete outside the norms or the rules that we've all got used to. That's Ben Wallace. Every day, we see our adversaries using cyber tools against us, using disinformation into our society, in, in some areas using financial corruption, using organised crime to divide us, to weaken us or to compete with us. I ask him and General Carter what the risk is if we don't recognise and do something about this often invisible threat. The military chief responds first. So on the one hand, we might wake up one day and discover that we are in a police state and all of our freedoms have been denied us. That's one end of it. The other end of it is that our opponents will have found a way to unravel our democracy from inside and our freedom, our way of life, and all the things that we espouse will have been undermined and we won't have noticed it. Without a shot being fired. That, that successful grey zone warfare from adversaries is that they know that... If they can do all of those things, they might not have to commit a gun or a tank or anything. And they would have done it using proxies, done it through cyber, done it through crippling an economy. And then if you did want to drive in one day with your armoured brigade, there's not much left to get in the way. 
General Carter says the grey zone could also spark a full-on armed conflict. What is the biggest threat in the grey zone? Miscalculation. Because what you're having here is a significant amount of activity, which is below the threshold of what we would call war. But the risk of that activity being misunderstood or indeed escalation occurring as a consequence of it that ends up lighting a fuse is the thing that is most worrying. And of course, if you look back over history, it's those moments of miscalculation which often precipitate what ends up being an uncontrollable state of war. And that's the bit that we really, really have to watch. The whole concept of what warfare can be and therefore what the threat looks like is changing. Try to think of the grey zone as a global battlefield. The front line is everywhere and no one is too unimportant to be a target. Opposing sides are blurred, with governments, big business and criminal gangs all using the same kind of tactics to attack each other and everyone else. The weapons of choice include deliberately crafted lies spread online, cyber hacks and bribes. But the grey zone has many physical dimensions too. At the sharp end, there are assassinations to eliminate someone who perhaps poses a threat or is causing a problem. There's also energy. Countries with oil and gas could use it to pressure nations that rely on their power to act a certain way or perhaps turn a blind eye to a certain wrong. Grey zone warfare touches corporations too. Imagine you're a small firm manufacturing a clever piece of technology that's used by a larger company, which, say, happens to be building sensitive military equipment for the UK government. A Chinese firm wants to buy you for a decent price, and you accept. But what then if relations between the UK and China become fraught? A way for Beijing to harm London could be to use this Chinese-owned British company to sabotage the kit with faulty technology or technology that includes spyware, which is able to look at what the British government is doing. When you start to think about all the different ways to hurt another nation short of war, the grey zone options are literally endless. Back to Graham Lamb. If you were the ruler of a rogue state and you had all the levers of power at your disposal, what would you, how would you go about undoing a democracy? You don't just go against the military. You don't just stand up with the equivalent of 12 carrier groups, like the America's got, or uh, an opposite number to an F-35 strike fighter. What you do is you work on all the other things, which is this grey zone, you, the, the sort of what I call hybrid, the sort of the warfare people can't find the word for, but it's all this other stuff, where you're operating by design through diplomatic channels, through intelligence channels, through information in the media, through, in fact, political channels, through economic channels, where you're undoing confidence in an economy. In the grey zone, the whole point is to cause harm to your enemy and gain an advantage without them feeling sufficiently threatened or realising they're under attack. You know, there's the old, that great maxim that says, you know, if you want to boil a frog, you don't drop it into boiling water because it'll jump straight out again. You put it in cold water and you slowly bring the water up to boil. In doing so, by the time the frog realises it's getting too hot, it's lost the energy to be able to jump out. We're being boiled like a frog. Security is something most people in Western democracies take for granted. They probably don't worry about dying in a bomb blast or a gunfight when stepping outside their front door. Food is almost always in the shops, petrol is in the pumps, and power is pretty much guaranteed to flow through your home with the flick of a switch. The coronavirus pandemic has corrected this complacency a little, but people still generally expect to live securely, though perhaps now with a stockpile of toilet roll. In Western democracies, there's also the protection of the rule of law, the freedom to speak and governance by democratically elected and accountable politicians. But these aren't divine rights. If people fail to protect them, they will falter, especially when those operating in the grey zone choose to exploit a society's vulnerabilities. People are coming here to kill our people. They are absolutely killing our way of life because they're bringing doubt, misinformation, all the sort of normal stuff you see in the cyber world and all the rest. 
they bring in this constant message of we're not good enough, we're not fit for, you know, divide and rule. So you separate the parts of Britain, you separate the individuals within the country, and suddenly, in fact, now they're malleable. So these things are absolutely under attack by others who wish to gain an advantage, whether it's a criminal, whether it's a proxy, whether it's a militia, whether it's a rogue nation, whether it's, in fact, a functioning state which sits down and uses its veto or it uses its own authority, its own capabilities, which are in the cyber world significant to therefore, in fact, what I call undo world order. It's what's happening now as you listen to this podcast and it's why understanding the threat is so important. Our journey begins in Salisbury, the site of one of the most high profile grey zone attacks on the UK. The attempted assassination of Sergei and Yulia Skripal and the fake news that followed. You can play a game how to get Salisbury. Oh, in, in Russia? In Russia, yes. What, what is it? It's a, it's a board game. It's a board game, yes. It's uh, with uh, all rules, with uh, uh, Skripal House and everything. Just so what, like a Monopoly board? It, m- Monopoly, it's just you, uh, it's a, more like a ladder. Do you know, a snake and ladder. Oh, snakes and ladders, yes. yes. Oh, to find your way to Salisbury yes. Cathedral. Yes. I'm with a woman whose own life was turned upside down by suspected Russian assassins. Marina Litvinenko's late husband, Alexander, or Sasha, was also a former Russian spy living in the UK. He too was viewed as a traitor by the Kremlin, having become an increasingly vocal critic of President Vladimir Putin after he started a new life in the UK with British citizenship. Moscow is accused of dispatching two hitmen to kill him. Their weapon was a radioactive poison, polonium-210. They slipped it into his green tea after inviting him to a meeting at the Millennium Hotel in London's Mayfair in November 2006. He took more than three agonising weeks to die. The poisoning was described as a nuclear attack on the streets of London, and London held Moscow responsible. Her past means Marina feels a close attachment with the events of the 4th of March 2018 in Salisbury. Order taking to uh, assassinate people is not taking just day before. And unfortunately, is not have, how to say, aborted. You know, like sometimes you're watching movie, mission aborted in the, yeah. the last minute. No, when it made an order, it never aborted. Just one day it happened. It's the same as with Skripal, when he was uh, exchanged. But for Putin, it was always he is a betrayer. And for betrayer, it's only this. Two officers from Russia's GRU Military Intelligence Agency allegedly travelled to Salisbury by train from London, armed with a liquid nerve agent. Such substances attack a body's nervous system and are banned under international law. The choice of a chemical weapon for the attack is part of the grey zone message being sent not just to Sergei, who, as I mentioned at the start, was a former colonel in the GRU, but to anyone else deemed to have betrayed Russia. It was also a warning to the UK, the country that turned him. The particular nerve agent used was from a group called Novichok, first developed by the former Soviet Union. The would-be assassins walked to the Skripal house from the station and sprayed the poison, contained in a perfume bottle, onto the front door. They then returned to London, flying out of the country later that day. Marina and I retrace their steps to Sergei's semi-detached property. Um, I have a feeling it's that house there without the cars in front of. Uh, you know, guys, I think it's the left one. You know why? It's a new roof. Sergei came to the UK in 2010 following a spy swap that saw him and three other Russian prisoners exchanged in Vienna for 10 alleged undercover Russian agents who'd been arrested by the FBI in the United States. Salisbury was an obvious place for him to settle, as it was also where his former MI6 handler apparently lived. But eight years later, Sergei's government-funded home had to be completely decontaminated and a new roof fitted after he and his daughter were poisoned. He's never returned, and by the look of the lifeless windows, 
No one else has raced to move in. So how does it feel? I mean, that's the house. You know, it's so interesting. When our house was contaminated, nobody cared about this house. It was only things uh, we need to be get out as soon as it was uh, realized it was polonium, radioactive. Then uh, we had just 20 minutes to get out. Then As we stand across the road from the house, a neighbour suddenly interrupts uh, us. A letter from... Excuse me. Hi. What are you doing here? We're very oh, sorry. What's she up? angrily tells us the lives of residents have been turned upside down since the attack and asks us to leave. Can I, can I say my kindness to you? Because I came through exactly the same. My husband was killed in 2006 in London. I now recognise you. I do apologise. And I feel for you exactly... The two women instantly seem to understand each other and start talking, united by a common horror. Two separate Russia-linked poisonings without justice, just lives ruined, and a reminder that the grey zone can affect anyone at any time. I've chosen not to share the full exchange to respect the neighbour's privacy. I was always saying just how I feel, how is the people of local living here and just ordinary people was just damaged. Yeah. Unbelievable. And nobody understand it. No. Because everybody sees the spy story, yeah. everybody sees this is relationship between Russia, UK. No, it's not about this. It's no. about lives yeah. of people. We leave, stopping briefly to reflect. Marina is visibly upset. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? Yes. I do, you know, I, I, I do understand it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's quite emotional, really. But it was more emotional to meet neighbours, uh, real people who met Skripal, who called him friends. When Sergei and Yulia Skripal left his house for the last time, they'd already been exposed to a deadly poison. They just didn't know it yet. At around 1.30 that afternoon, the pair drove into the city centre. They parked and headed to a pub for a drink. Then they went to Zizi, the pizza restaurant, for lunch, where they probably started to feel unwell. After eating, they walked a short distance to a small park area framed by the River Avon. It was here the invisible nerve agent finally overwhelmed the Scripples. They collapsed on a park bench, surrounded by the otherwise ordinary bustle of a Sunday afternoon. A teenage girl out with her brother and mother, an army medic, was one of the first to notice something was wrong and an ambulance was quickly called. We're sitting in a place called the Moltings in Salisbury. It's pretty much back to normal. You'd never know that this was the scene of where one of the most famous attacks on British soil ended up with the, the victims collapsed. I would say maybe not people forget it, but they want to forget it, because until you remember, you can't live your normal, ordinary life. But it don't need to be forgotten, because what we already said, without that, it might happen again in another very quiet, very peaceful place, and life others might be destroyed, even lost. The quick action of medics helped to save the lives of the Skripals. The assassination attempt had failed. But the grey zone message that you are not safe had still been sent to anyone viewed as a traitor by the Kremlin. The message to the UK was also clear. Russia apparently still felt it could get away with murder on British soil, 12 years on from the killing of Alexander Litvinenko. And to start with, I don't think any of us really quite appreciated what had happened. Mark Sedwell, or Lord Sedwell as he's now known, was the UK's national security advisor and top civil servant until September 2020. If you think about it, you, we didn't have a playbook um, or a, an instruction manual on how to deal with people sitting in a quiet park in a quiet English country town suffering a chemical weapons attack. You know, that isn't something that you train uh, for because it had never happened before. And so the first responders realised that this wasn't just you know, two people who'd had a seizure, um, or who you know, who'd had some other kind of naturally occurring uh, problem, but actually there was something out of the ordinary here. And it was only uh, after that and that first response um, that then the information filtered through to us at the centre that actually there was something genuinely 
um, malign uh, had happened, and it was completely extraordinary that that, uh, that some kind of nerve agent had been deployed, as I say, in a quiet uh, country uh, country town. And then, of course, your next question is, well, who and how and why? The fallout from the poisoning was only just beginning. A police officer, Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, was left seriously ill after being exposed to the nerve agent when he went to investigate the Skripal house. Fears of a deadly Novichok trail prompted police to cordon off several contaminated sites. Then, four months later, a local man, Charlie Rowley, happened across a discarded perfume bottle thought to be the same one used in the attack and gave it to his girlfriend, Dawn Sturgis, as a gift. They both fell critically ill, and eight days later, Dawn Sturgis became the first death from this grey zone attack. The terror of the poisoning was combined with what British analysts claim was a significant information operation by Russia. A study by King's College London counted 138 separate and often contradictory narratives published by the Russian state channel RT and news website Sputnik in the four weeks after the poisoning. Coverage was gradual initially, but picked up significantly after this statement to Parliament by then Prime Minister Theresa May on the 12th of March. The government has concluded that it is highly likely that Russia was responsible for the act against Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Mr Speaker, this attempted murder using a weapons-grade nerve agent in a British town was not just a crime against the Skripals. It was an indiscriminate and reckless act against the United Kingdom, putting the lives of innocent civilians at risk. And we will not tolerate such a brazen attempt to murder innocent civilians on our soil. I commend this statement to the House. I asked Mark Sedwell what it was like to deal simultaneously with the poisoning and the disinformation. Did it feel as though like reality, you're like starting to question yourself? Or, or... I think certainly, certainly you, you, we, we, we questioned the, I think the underlying assumptions. You know, that that you know, there, was, there was a sort of unspoken assumption, really, that we all follow, there are certain rules, even among adversaries, certainly state adversaries, that we all understand. And this broke all of those rules. This was way the other side of them. It was the first chemical or weapons attack in Western Europe in a century and the first outside wartime sort of ever, really. And also and, going after a spy that had been involved in a spy swap. Exactly. So he wasn't an obvious... You know, it wasn't an obvious target in the sense of a threat to the, to the Russian state. It was a revenge attack of some, uh, of some kind. So we were trying to deal with, with all of that. Um, uh, and then, as you say... We had this information uh, campaign coming at us as well. And I think the thing that was different about that and that it took people some time to appreciate was that we weren't facing our narrative, the truth, based on the evidence in the investigation, versus a single alternative narrative from the Russians. The Russians weren't seeking to do that because they knew in the end that any single narrative they came up with was going to be punctured because, of course, it wasn't true. So what they sought to do was simply confuse and so they put out dozens of different uh, narratives through lots of different means, social media, their official media, uh, spokesmen, and so on, really you know, changing their story, um, uh, contradicting themselves. The King's College study found the most prominent set of storylines in the Russian coverage of the Skripal poisoning tackled the response by the UK and its allies, claiming that there was a lack of evidence that Moscow was to blame. Like assassinations, the deliberate spreading of lies or a distorted version of the truth to sow doubt or to deceive is nothing new. Britain used such tactics against the Nazis in the Second World War, including with fake German radio stations set up by a journalist called Sefton Delmer, a fluent German speaker. Achtung, Achtung, hier Gustav Siegfried I. Ich komme gerade zurück aus Abend. Mr Delmer said the aim of his first station, called Gustav Siegfried Eims, was to, quote, spread disruptive and disturbing news among the Germans, which will induce them to distrust their government and disobey it. This included bogus reports on Nazi corruption and scandalous claims about military wives having affairs while their husbands were away fighting. Fast forward 80 years, 
and campaigns of disinformation or black propaganda are still spread via radio shows or innocent-looking news articles. The game-changer is digital technology and social media. It means fake news can be shared around the world to more people faster than ever before. You know, the Russians were putting 60 bits of major media out there from the 4th of March. Hamish de Breton Gordon is a chemical weapons expert and former army colonel who also happens to live near Salisbury. He agrees to meet in the city centre. And I think one thing that the British government didn't really, and still I don't think, understand is this business of, you know, the, the government's view is, well, we must put stuff out that's correct. It takes 48 hours for clearance of, of a line to come out. In that time, the Russians have put out 120 major pieces. People believe it. I mean, highly educated people I know sort of do from time to time say, well, did we get this right? And even had a conversation with somebody today saying, guys, this, did the Salisbury thing really happen? Wasn't it just a set up and you sort of go, crikey? Because they've had so much of this disinformation. Had Russia chosen to launch a missile on Sergei Skripal's house, it would have been a clear act of war that could well have justified a conventional military response by the UK. But the alleged dispatching of deniable hitmen, shrouded by waves of what the UK claimed was state-backed disinformation, meant the British retaliation came from the grey zone too, and it started quickly. Mr Speaker, the House will recall that following the murder of Mr Litvinenko, the UK expelled four diplomats. Under the Vienna Convention, the United Kingdom will now expel 23 Russian diplomats who have been identified as undeclared intelligence officers. They have just one week to leave. Russian President Vladimir Putin denied the Salisbury allegations while calling Sergei Skripal a traitor to the motherland and a scumbag. But less than two weeks after the attack, Britain's spy agencies and the police had gathered enough evidence to convince allies across the world to join in a mass expulsion of Russian spies as punishment. It was a clear sign the UK had learnt lessons from the Litvinenko assassination when it was seen as having been too slow and too cautious in its response. Mark Sedwell again. It was clear we had to move faster this time, and that meant uh, taking some quite challenging decisions about declassifying intelligence for use with the public, and in particular with allies, um, being ready to say, look, yeah, we haven't got all the details yet in the early stages, we haven't yet collected all the evidence, but it was the Russian state, and we called them out. And there's no alternative, there's no plausible alternative the quick use of facts backed by evidence is one of the most effective ways to fight back against disinformation in the grey zone. So we move very, very quickly to put together the diplomatic sanctions, the expulsions, in particular of the Russian intelligence uh, capabilities, military intelligence capabilities and others around Europe and the, uh, and the rest of the Western uh, democracies to try and regain the initiative after an attack of that kind. And that's probably one of the key lessons from Salisbury. But not every ally joined in the mass expulsion, including EU member state Austria, perhaps sufficiently persuaded by the Russian information campaign. What did you think of that? Look, you're always frustrated, of course. Country, some countries who, for whom this was hard because of their interests with Russia and because of their traditional relationships um, would look for um, opportunities to slow things down and to find um, reasons not to take a difficult decision. And we had to factor that in, you know, that some of the uh, pressure back at us, if you like, from countries who were finding this hard was, well, why do you have to go so fast? Why can't you wait until the investigation is complete? Why can't you wait until you're 100% sure that it was them because you know, there, might be, there might be other explanations? And, of course, the information campaign that you referred to a minute ago was part of... Um, that, that was the audience, that was part of the audience. It was designed to influence. It wasn't just trying to... Um, influence citizens in this country, but it was trying to influence foreign governments and create confusion and doubt about the, the, British, uh, the British narrative and position. The Kremlin retaliated with tit-for-tat expulsions and doubled down on its denials. But Britain's response wasn't over. Counterterrorism police and intelligence officers 
spent the next six months building their case against Russia. Then, on the 5th of September, UK prosecutors charged two Russian nationals with the attempted murder of the Skripals. I'm therefore appealing for anyone who has information about the suspects named by the Crown Prosecution Service today as Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bosharov to contact the police. Both suspects are approximately 40 years old. They are both Russian nationals and they were travelling on Russian passports. It is likely that they were travelling under aliases and these are not their real names. Images were shared tracing the men's movements from their arrival at Gatwick Airport on the 2nd of March to two trips to Salisbury, including on the day of the poisoning. Then, Mrs May stood up once again in Parliament with a direct message for the GRU. We're increasing our understanding of what the GRU is doing in our countries, shining a light on their activities, exposing their methods and sharing them with our allies, just as we have done with Salisbury. It triggered a bizarre response from Moscow with the two accused men appearing on state-backed Russian television to protest their innocence in person. What were you doing there? Our friends had suggested to us for quite a long time that we visit this wonderful city. Salisbury, a wonderful yes. city. What makes it so wonderful? They have a famous cathedral. A famous cathedral, Salisbury Cathedral, is famous throughout Europe. And in fact, it's famous throughout the world. It's famous for its 123 meter spire. It's also famous for its clock. It's one of the oldest working clocks in the world. Journalism can wield great power in the grey zone as a force for good or for bad. The Skripal poisoning and the evidence released by the police offered up clues for a new breed of investigative digital journalists to follow. It really wasn't until the uh, British authorities published the names and the photographs of the individuals involved, because before then there wasn't too much for us to work on. Elliot Higgins is the founder of the investigative website Bellingcat. And why was it called Bellingcat? It was a fable about um, a group of uh, mice who were very scared of a ferocious cat. And they came up with the idea of putting a bell on its neck, but they realised they didn't actually have a plan to do that. So we're teaching people how to bell the cat. Um, then I googled bellinthecat.com and that was $4,000 to register. So I took the vert out and had bell and cat and it was $40, so I used that. He and his colleagues are experts in analysing online photographs and trawling mass databases for tips. Data and imagery can be vital to expose the truth behind a grey zone attack. The Bellingcat team was able to draw on experience they'd gained from tracking an alleged GRU mission in Montenegro. In that operation from a couple of years earlier, Russia was suspected of backing a coup plot. Previously, one of our researchers, Christo Grozev, had been looking into GRU, Russian intelligence um, activity, uh, in relation to the Montenegro coup. Um, there, um, what had happened is the, one of these coup plotters had been um, arrested. He had two fake, he had a fake identity and a real identity, and there were similarities between them, like the date of birth, his first name, and some other details. Um, so Christo thought, well, maybe this is what we have with these uh, GRU officers, or suspected GRU officers, in relation to the Skripal poisoning. Bellingcat and its partners managed to uncover the true identities of the two men accused by the UK of the poisonings. Almost immediately as these names were revealed, uh, Russian um, kind of independent media managed to acquire uh, a list of people who were on the plane, including their passport numbers. Um, this had the passport numbers of the two suspects, and funny enough, they were only a few numbers different. So that was massively suspicious. Um, so we were able to, and these documents had very weird markings on them, um, you know, saying stuff like, you know, this is, you know, not for, you know, this is uh, security service related. And if you see this document, phone this number that was like linked to the Russian Ministry of Defense which is not on normal forms of this type because everyone's supposed to fill them in. Like their history as well was just completely blank in it. So we found their fake identity documents and how they were registered, which were very suspicious, and we eventually found their real identities. But how? Can you just give a sense of how you managed to do that? In one case, it was quite easy to do because the guy had the same first name, um, place of birth, and uh, date of birth. And we basically plugged that information into these Russian databases and it gave us a very small selection of results. We then looked into each individual because that then gave us addresses, second name and other details. And nearly all these individuals had like an online presence. So we could identify who they were and then kind of 
cross them off the list and eventually just reduced it down to one individual. When we had that one individual, we then dug into all their other details and we managed to acquire their real passport. And that showed exactly the same photograph that was on their fake passport. The other guy, though, wasn't as easy. Um, he um, hadn't used um, the same first name. He hadn't used the same place of birth. But what we did there was thought, OK, let's do a profile for this guy, like a criminal profile. So we knew he was around a certain age based off what he looked like. We knew that um, on his fake ID, he had an age on that. So we thought, okay, if he's a foreign operative, he was probably gonna be working uh, or trained at a specialized academy for the GRU. So we basically looked at the graduates from a certain period of time. We started going through the list of graduates and eliminating them. Eventually we reduced the list down to quite a small number of people and started finding you know, photographs of them online. Not all of them were still GRU officers and went off and did different things. But by doing this process of elimination, it took us down to one individual who again, we were able to get the passport um, restoration for, and it was the guy's photograph. So we had two real identities to these two fake personas. Alexander Petrov is actually Dr. Alexander Mishkin, a military doctor in the GRU, while Ruslan Boshirov's true identity is Colonel Anatoly Chapiga, another GRU officer. Bellingcat also revealed evidence of a third suspect, though so far the UK's never formally charged anyone else a guy called Dennis Sergev, and he had been travelling uh, around the same time. We were able to have a whistleblower at the Russian phone company who sent us his complete phone records for two years, including the period of the Scripple poisoning. And that included every single cell phone tower he connected to in London. And using that, we could track his movements basically from the airport all the way through London, where his path crossed with the two Scripple suspects just before they got on the train and went to Salisbury. Over time... Bellingcat has gathered more databases and information on other alleged grey zone activities by a whole team of GRU officers, codenamed Unit 29155. Do you believe that their sole intent is assassinations or is it, is it, is it other elements of sub-threshold warfare? Um, from what we can see, there's assassinations that they're involved with. Um, there's, um, we're not sure that they're involved with hacking. We think that's actually done by a separate unit. But they are involved with um, organising coups. Um, so it seems that they are more on, I guess, even more the darker side of this. It's not hacking. It's assassinations and basically overthrowing governments. Mm. And, I mean, what do you, how, how do you respond to the, um, the sort of the allegations that are thrown at Bellingcat that... Uh, instead of revealing the truth, you're actually you're part of the conspiracy. You're part you know part of the British state, and you're being fed stuff by the MI6 and CIA. And actually, what you're revealing is just part of a, a grey zone style attack on Russia. Well. Um I mean, Valencat came from basically me starting a blog in 2012 and then crowdfunding a site in 2014. So uh, if we're an intelligence operation, we're a pretty poorly funded uh, one. As well as the very public criminal charges and diplomatic expulsions, the UK is also thought to have hit back in more covert ways, like quietly targeting illicit money flows out of Russia in a further attempt to deter attacks. Moscow still says it's unfairly accused in the Skripal poisoning. Here's Sky News's Dermot Murnahan asking the then Russian ambassador to the UK, Alexander Yakovenko, about the case. The coincidence of two GRU officers being sightseeing in Salisbury on the same day. Uh, that's the story of the, of the British press and also the government. But unfortunately, it's not supported by the fact. First of all, they gave an interview in the Russian television and they so said officially they are not part of the GRU. This is first. And second, uh, the British side uh, could have an opportunity to question them, but they would never ask for that. So if a they simple ask, request from the Foreign Office will allow them to be questioned? Yeah, we were ready to consider. But the request never appeared. There was no request. Why? Well, well why do you think? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No suspect has been tried, and there seems little chance of that ever happening. It's left critics thinking the UK should have gone even further in its response to make the cost of this kind of alleged activity by Moscow so high it wouldn't be repeated. Then, two and a half years after Salisbury, this happened. 
Hi there, good evening. The German government says hospital tests show that the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, was poisoned by a nerve agent from the Novichok group. That's the same type of nerve agent that was used to poison the former Russian spy, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter, Julia, in Salisbury in 2018. Russia's... Another victim of the nerve agent Novichok. Unlike the Skripals, Alexei Navalny was poisoned in Russia. He was flown to Germany, where doctors helped save his life and uncovered how he'd fallen sick. The Kremlin is again under suspicion and again denying involvement. The EU and the UK have imposed sanctions on six Russian officials they claim were involved in the poisoning. This includes the current head of the FSB Security Service, the successor agency to the Soviet-era KGB. Economic sanctions are another kind of weapon used in the grey zone. But the risk is that they too fail to deter. Marina Litvinenko is worried. She thinks if previous British governments had been stronger in their response to the killing of her husband in 2006, the attempt on the Skripal's lives wouldn't have been made either. It's a very similar because he tried this uh, with my husband, Sasha case. It was a lot of noise, but it was, OK, what, what, you, what you will do? You will, you will break our relationship? No. Of course, it was some break in communication between security service. They don't spend uh, a lot of secrets between each other, but people still able to come to this country, to buy what they want, to send their children, everything. Nothing changed. It's all the same. But something is changing. Every time an attack, like the Skripal poisoning, or the Litvinenko murder happens, it becomes a little less shocking. The acceptable level of violence for a country like the UK, that's supposedly not at war, climbs just that bit higher. The use of disinformation also creates doubt about who was to blame. The frog, to repeat Graham Lamb's phrase, is being boiled alive, but hasn't yet noticed. Trust me, what Churchill said of our journey, inevitable in his eyes, into World War II was entirely preventable. We can prevent that. If we don't, then the answer is enjoy the gathering storm because bad news is coming. Disinformation has lots of other uses too. It's at the heart of an unprecedented battle between truth and lies that's threatening democratic elections across the world. Information warfare goes on all the time. And I, I call it the 4D model, which is dismiss, distort, distract and dismay. But that's next time, as we continue into the grey zone. Into the Grey Zone is a Sky News podcast. It was edited and produced by Chris Scott, with production support from Sophia McBride and Victoria Seabrook, and narrated by me, Deborah Haynes. The head of Sky News Radio is Dave Terrace. And a special thanks to Lord Ashcroft for the use of his archive audio from World War II. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.